A lot of people, the really smart, hardworking, good intention people, they can power through everything. As you go up in a level of organization, the work is done more with and through other people. Scientists, engineers, doctors, they will tell me, I'm an awesome scientist, but now I'm running the lab. In fact, I'm messing everything up. And a lot of times they would think, you know, oh, I'm the smartest guy in the room, so, you know, I should be the leader. And then they get there and realize, oh man, this is so much harder than it looks. All right, welcome to Tech Careers and Money Talk. I am your host, Christopher Nelson. I've been in the tech industry for 20 plus years. And after climbing my way to the C-suite, working for three companies that have been through IPO and investing my way to financial independence, I'm here to help you figure out how to do it too and introduce you to people that can help you out. And a part of this is really thinking about career and money and how it all works together. Well, today I'm excited to introduce you to Margaret Andrews. Margaret Andrews is an instructor at Harvard and she runs the Milo Center, which is managing yourself and leading others. She has, you know, one of the most attended uh, sessions that she has for MBA students at Harvard. And the concept is we need to be self-aware in managing ourselves so we can be effective in leading others. We know that, especially in technology companies, we need to be focused on leadership. I'm excited to introduce you to her today. Let's go talk with Margaret. I am so excited to introduce you today to Margaret Andrews. Margaret ran the MBA program at MIT Sloan uh, School of Management for seven years before becoming an associate dean at Harvard University. She teaches several graduate courses, including creativity and innovation, leading with emotional intelligence. But what I'm really interested in is her two-day executive program, Managing Yourself and Leading Others. It is the most popular professional development program at Harvard. She's also been written about in media outlets such as the Wall Street Journal and Times of India. But this is what I love. Do not hate Margaret. You've won three lotteries and didn't buy any tickets. They were all given to her. Like, yes. wow. (laughs) <laughs> that's amazing. No one now. You, that's the reason that you don't have to work for equity. You won all the lotteries, right? <laughs> that's right. And you know, I'm always open to more tickets. So you know, <laughs> I you guess yeah. If I'm going to give you a ticket, I'm definitely going to give it to you. And on the back, say I'm I'm in for half, right? Because yeah. <laughs> you, you've got the lucky touch. <laughs> well, that's fair. Well, thanks so much for coming on today. Appreciate you joining. Thank you. Thanks for asking me. I'm I've been looking forward to this. Well, excellent. I I love origin stories. And I know in getting to know you, the one thing that you always talk about that I want to take a moment because I know that there are people who work in tech who are in the accounting, in the finance, and the tax department that you do proclaim you are a recovered accountant. I am. I'm a recover. I, I will say I'm a recovering CPA. Yes, that's recovering true. Recovering CPA. So walk us through a little bit about, you know, how you went from CPA to now all of a sudden, you know, running the Sloan School of Business um, in, in where you what you're doing now. Yeah, well, thanks. Um, So yeah, I started my career as a CPA in San Francisco. uh, And I did that for about four years. um, And I was actually on the tax side, but um, Mm. also did audit work and things like that. Uh, And I realized I don't think I want to do this. This isn't really right, you know, what I want to do uh, for the rest of my life it doesn't fit me that well. Um, so I didn't know what I wanted to do. So I did the um, the obvious thing, which was to go back to business school. Um, so I did that. Uh, and then I came out and I thought, you know, I was very narrow in my career before and I want to stay broad for a while. So I went into strategy consulting and I did that for I guess I did it with one of the big firms uh, for about five years um, and actually really enjoyed it. Really, I joined the right firm, had uh, great people that I worked with and things like that. Um, And I found myself gravitating to two types of work. One was marketing kinds of things and the other was executive education, which we did a lot there. And uh, so I said, I want to do one of those. And so I found one in marketing. And so I did, um, I was a VP of marketing at a a financial services firm. Uh, and I did that for a couple of years. And then I, uh, through a series of lucky accidents, 
I uh, became the executive director of the MBA program at the MIT Sloan School of Management. Um, so I kind of found, I mean, I knew I loved higher education, but that was kind of a, a dream job, really. And MIT had tried to hire me a couple of other times previously, but it wasn't the right job at, at the time, and it wasn't the right time. It wasn't, I didn't feel like they were really... Uh, quite ready to do what I thought needed to be done. So at this point, they had gone um, uh, down in the rankings. Uh, and you know They never cared about the business school rankings until they fell in the top 10. Uh, and then all of a sudden they cared, <laughs> right? Because people were saying, well, why should I go to a school that's not in the top 10? Uh, so anyway, that was part of my charge uh, was, mm. you know, out and uh, it was an awesome job because I got to use all of my consulting skills, um, right. but I had to eat my own cooking, right? So, uh, <laughs> yes. so I actually had to implement all this stuff, and it was uh, really challenging and really fun uh, uh, to do wow. that. So I did that, um, and I um, uh, was at MIT Sloan for about seven years, and so I worked on you know the MBA program, admissions, and student affairs, and career development, and marketing for the school and alumni relations mm. and that. So I realized, hey, you know, I, I kind of like this turnaround stuff. Um, so anyway, I went out and uh, did some more consulting. And then one of my clients hired me and that was Har Harvard. Um, so I was uh, associate dean um, at Harvard running management programs for, mm. I guess, about six years. Um, and during that time, we, you know, revamped the program. You can see a theme here. Uh, and yes. also starting up some um, executive programs or professional development programs. So I did that for, I guess, about uh, six years, um, then went off and, and joined an um, international business school where I ran uh, all the graduate programs across, what was it, five campuses in four countries and wow. 16 time zones. Um, oh. So did that for a while. And then I realized, you know, I kind of, I've been teaching now for the last 15 years and found that uh, that's actually what I really like doing. I really, wow. really like teaching. So um, I've been teaching in Harvard for about a little over 15 years now, and I'm just kind of doing more of that. So I've created lots of classes and, uh, you know, managing yourself and leading others was absolutely the it was the first one. And it was the one that I had sort of in my heart that had to come out. Uh, wow. So, yeah. So fun. before we get into that, I'm going to, I'm going to reel back a little bit. It sounds like the real inflection point for you was that experience in strategy consulting. It seemed like all of a sudden it gave you a broader business view. It gave you a broader, arguably worldview. What were, what were some of the you know, what were some of the things that you became aware of, like, like playing that or, or having that role? Because I do think I myself came out of school and I did big four consulting for a number of years before I moved on to other things. And even at, at an entry level, and I think especially at a post MBA strategy level, what you witness there, um, I know creates a lot of opportunities or, or the, the awareness of opportunities. Absolutely. I, I think that is so true. I would say that the five years that I spent in consulting were some of the best education years I've ever had. Yes. Uh, since that, you know, when I was a, uh, being a CPA, one of the best things I took out of working there, I worked for Deloitte, was I have great work paper technique, right? You know, <laughs> I can, you know, find things, etc. You know, I, I leave that trail of crumbs, etc. So right. that was actually a great learning and I've carried it through the whole of my life. And with strategy consulting, it's always kind of looking through it at different angles, right? It's, you know, right. what if... And what if that? And, and um, you know, there's I'm a believer and this is, you know, part of what I teach is that there is no single right answer to almost any question, in, certainly in leadership, right. uh, usually in business mm. and most things in life, right, that there are some are better than others. But there is no single right answer that every every um, decision that you make involves mm -hmm. trade offs and has consequences. And That's so right. you have to weigh all of those things. So, you know, you can't say always do this because there are times when that's not the right thing to do. So uh, I think strategy consulting really helped with that a lot. And uh, we always had this um, 
saying that uh, I worked with really smart, really nice people, right? It was a great combination. And uh, we always had this saying there that when we're reviewing things, when we're looking over the deck or, you know, the, the report or something, we said, we're beating up on the deck, not each other. Right. And that was the best thing because anyone could say anything, right? You know, I don't like that. That doesn't make sense. Wrong, whatever. And and it was never personal. It was about Mm. making it better. And it was our product. So we want to make it better. And, and I've carried that forward as well. So it was great. That's so interesting because I learned the same lesson. And it seems like this, you know, you think about consulting is a people business. They need to develop people. People are their products. Right. Yes. And yes. And, and I'm saying this in a healthy way, not in a sterile like their product, I, but they're developing people. And that was one of the uh, I think it was a piece of advice that I got from a mentor, you know, leader there was make the conversation about the work. It's not about the person who did the work. We're trying to, you know, vet the work and make it stronger. And I think that's a that's a very sound principle that's been with me to this day. Yeah, it's it's uh, it's great, and it's never it's not personal. But by making it not personal, we develop personally, right? It's kind That's of that. right. Yeah. Now, when you are in strategy, and this to me is where I'm I'm seeing that there was there was a an inflection point in your career because it was really after the strategy that you started moving towards education and especially executive education. I know, and and I've I've done some strategy roles when I was in consulting as well is I find that strategy consultants really are looking at, you know, sort of the roadmap, the plan, or they look in and they say, I want to develop the people because mm-hmm. regardless of the map or the plan, if I actually make the people better, that may have a bigger impact on this company, this you know program that we're developing. What was there some type of an inciting incident or you know, moment where you realized I'm more drawn to developing the people than creating these plans. Actually, you know, I think I've always gravitated to what I'm going to call the people side of the business that Mm. in strategy consulting a lot, what you oftentimes hear, and I'm sure you've heard it is that, you know, oh, we had this great strategy, but we couldn't implement it. And then Mm. I, I always think, well, then you didn't have Good strategy, right? If you can't implement it, it's it's not good. Uh, and if you don't have the skills for it, it's not the right strategy. So uh, mm. I've always thought that much more integrated than people often. You you can't do one without the other. Uh, right. You know, you have the heads of the coin and the tails of tails of the coin. It's right. still the same coin. Uh, so so yeah, I've always been drawn to that. And. Um, you know, you, you were asking about inciting incidents and, and I was saying that, you know, the Milo class was one that just absolutely, it was inside of me and just was like, you know, think right. of alien, it had to come out. Uh, <laughs> and so, it's a great uh, visual. you know, and, <laughs> yeah, there were really two. Uh, so, you know, one was maybe the seed and the other was the water or, mm. you know, one was the fire and the other was the accelerant. So, you know, sure. pick whichever metaphor you like. <laughs> uh, but, you know, the first one was actually when I was in business school and we uh, had this case and it was this case about this guy, you know, real hotshot guy, somebody who, you know, you would want to be like uh, and things like that and just had this great background, etc. cetera. And um, he's go interviewing for this job that like everybody wants. So it's very, very competitive. Um, so, you know, he's, he's in this process and things like that and he gets the job. And then six months later, he is miserable in this job and he cannot figure out why. And of course, my classmates and I uh, had quite a chuckle at that because in the case, there are clues all throughout the process that this is the wrong job for him, but he misses all of them because he's so focused on getting the job. And I remember, you know, thinking that, but what really happened then was, you know, after we all graduated, we would, those of us that lived in the Boston area, we get together, you know, occasionally for, for beer or something like that. And after about six months, people started coming to those gatherings saying, oh my gosh, I'm Dan Davis, right? The name of the character. And right. And I, and I, and I, it wasn't just one or two. I mean, it was multiple. And I remember that's what struck me. I said, these are some of the smartest, kindest, hardest working people I know. How could that happen to them? 
And that just stayed with me, right? That was that seed or, you know, fire was starting to burn. And then later when I went to run the MBA program at MIT, I would get to know some students pretty well, right? And they'd tell me, oh, I'm going off to work at blank. And sometimes I go, ooh, you know, the, the kind of thinking what I know about this person and what I know about that organization, that just doesn't feel like a match. And if I knew them well enough, I would have a conversation, you know, kind of, are you sure? Um, and almost every time they would say, oh yeah, 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 you know, everything's fine. But Several times people called me about six months later and we had a really different conversation about, you know, how do they exit that and get to, uh, to something that they like. So I kept seeing this and I thought, man, we need to teach people. How do you understand yourself so that you can put yourself in the right environments? And, you know, I have this saying, you have to plant yourself where you will grow. Uh, and I just saw people planting themselves in the wrong soil again and again. Uh, so that was the first one. And the second one was much more deeply personal, uh, which was, you know, one time uh, one of my bosses said to me, uh, he said, you're not self-aware. And uh, and it was not said in a developmental. Way. <laughs> uh -oh. um, but it, yeah. it turned out to be exceedingly uh, developmental. Uh, mm. you know, and um, said, you know, you, you've done some great things, right, you know, and could take those things off. But, you know, I, I don't think you have a great leadership style. Um, mm. And so that rattled me. <laughs> that yeah. definitely rattled me. You know, I didn't have a great relationship with that boss. And when I really went to think about it, you know, I can be pretty hard charging and, you know, I want to run and run fast and I can be demanding. But, you know, I could also sometimes be a little insensitive. Um, to context oh, yeah, and things sure. like that, and uh, which is embarrassing to say, but was true. And uh, so I realized, you know, as I say, the worst part of that story was that he wasn't wrong. Uh, mm. And so I determined I do not want to be this way, right? I do not want to have this be, uh, you know, the way I am. So I started looking at all kinds of different things. You know, I looked at people I knew that were great leaders and academic studies and books and history and philosophy mm. and and all these kinds of things. Hmm. And I, you know, kind of um, when I was in that exploration, my goal was to say, how do we become better versions of ourselves? Right. Yes. And I meant that on kind of a leadership level right. as well as a personal level. Um, and so, you know, as I, I was going through this, I did find and I thought, ding, 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 there it is. Right. There it is. And guess what? It's in all of those things that I just mentioned. And so I changed that uh, my leadership style, you know, knowing this. And mm. uh, that's where Milo came from. That's where managing yourself and leading others came from. Um, and that secret was really that you have to manage Manage yourself before you lead others. And mm -hmm. that managing yourself comes to really uh, the first part of that is understanding yourself. You know, who are you? Who has shaped you? Uh, you know, the, the influences in your life, the people. And that includes, you know, obviously parents and family, but yes. friends, lovers, enemies, people that have helped you, people that have hurt you. Right. Uh, and you know, events, and I say lucky and lucky, unlucky accidents, right? They, mm. I, mine was a series of lucky accidents that got me to MIT, right? Uh, so those count. And lots of other things, your values and your definition of success. So I thought, you know, people understood themselves better. They would make much better choices for themselves. Mm. Uh, and therefore, they would be more sort of comfortable in their own skin. And those people make better leaders. So that was kind of what it's all about. Well, and it sounds like I want to, I want to sort of roll this back because I think there's some, some similarities into, you know, what, what I'm doing now. And I think what you're doing now, which is you see in, in, I remember you said there are these bright, smart, kind, hardworking people, but they can't see this blind spot. Like yes. they can't. And it's this thing that you know, causes them to make a series of unfortunate mistakes and get themselves into bad emotional states that can lead to bad physical states, et cetera. And that's honestly, you know, really the ethos of, of creating tech careers and money talk is, is again, it's the same thing. People start doing some of that stuff, right? They start leading themselves, but they're focused more on the career and they don't fold in the financial aspect. But I think that from a, and, and I like this whole concept of you have the fire and then you have the, the accelerant. I, I think the question is, it sounds to me like you sort of observe this pattern 
And then it was like, when you realized like, oh my gosh, like that's me too. That then became this accelerant that said, okay, I need to solve this for myself. And while I'm doing this, there's an opportunity to help other people. That's yeah, that's exactly right. Um, That, you know, I felt like my results were better. Uh, I was enjoying it more. Right. Uh, I was working insane hours uh, and things like that. So uh, it made a difference. It made a difference. And and I also realized that I enjoy teaching a lot. I love, love, love that light bulb moment when you see somebody, uh, you know, really have a change of heart or, cha- you know, they get it all of a sudden. And it's interesting that you say that, you know, with... Um, because you're right, a lot of people, the the really smart, hardworking, you know, good intention people, have gotten um, through everything. They can power through everything, right? They they just keep going. But as we know, you can't do that forever. And also, it, as you go up in a level of organization, the work is done more with and through other people. So it's not just you, and that's when it shows up. And I find that I get uh, in my, in, in particularly in these professional programs, I get a lot of um, STEM people, scientists, engineers, doctors, and uh, they will tell me a variation on the theme of, I'm an awesome scientist, but now I'm running the lab and I, I have no idea what I'm doing. And in fact, I'm messing everything up. Uh, you know, and, and a lot of times they would think, you know, oh, I'm the smartest guy in the room. So, you know, I should be the leader. And then they get there and realize, oh, yeah, exactly. I'll figure it out. And then they realize, oh, man, this is so much harder than it looks. So, yeah, I get well, it, it's a completely different discipline. So I want to I want to be able to get into all of that in the second half of the show. But right now, like, what is the what are the plans for the the Milo Center? I mean, I think this message and what you're communicating is so important. Um, are, are there ways that you're trying to to grow and educate other leaders, um, you know, outside of the Harvard arena? Yeah, you know, so I, um, you know, I do most of my teaching through Harvard, uh, and then I, you know, have private clients and things like that. Um, But, you know, I'm in the process right now of writing a book, which is very hard, as you know. Uh, It takes a lot of time and effort uh, and hair pulling, but uh, it's, that's part of it as well. So, you know, I've started doing some speaking. I I want- I'm I'm just laughing about the book writing (laughs) because it seems like book writing can also lead to a lot of just sad alone time. We're like, oh, but it's a process. I've had some of that. It's a process. It's definitely a process. And there's times I'm writing like, who wants to read this, right? And then- Right. (laughs) And you have good days too, uh, but yeah. So it's writing, speaking, uh, teaching, and uh, mm. that's kind of my my sort of three legged stool. Um, and each mm. one helps the other, uh, which yeah, I always felt. You know, when I was consulting and teaching, each of those helped the other uh, as well. So uh, I like things that I always like to have kind of a portfolio career uh, yes. because where I do lots of different things because I'm interested in a lot of different things. And when I get tired over here, I just take that hat off, go over here, put that hat on, and I can keep going. And keep moving forward. Which I forward. think you know that feeling. No, I do, I do. And I mean, I'm excited to be at that point in my career too, where there's, yeah, opportunities, uh, writing the book, talking, podcasting, et cetera. Yeah. Well, I, Thank you for the first half. We're going to take a quick break and then we're going to come back and we're going to get into manage yourself and leading others because it's something I'm really passionate about and I'm going to share a story to kick us off. We'll be right back. All right. Welcome back. We're back here with Margaret Andrews and I have to say like I am super excited about this half of the podcast because we are going to go deep on manage yourself and leading others. And I want to start off by saying two things. Number one is I appreciate you in the way that you teach because it's obvious to me from our first half of the conversation that like I have this mantra that's serve, educate, connect. And like you embody those same things, like this whole concept of, you know, Milo came out of you, something that broke your heart. You saw Mm -hmm. these people that were just crashing and burning. You're like, oh man, that hurts. You also realize then, wait, I have the same problem. There's an opportunity to then serve through education. And then there's, there's an instant connection, right? And this, and this is what we're identified on. So I just want to say, I see you. That's awesome. Great, thanks. And I want to start off. So 
I don't know. I think I may have told you the story before, but I want to tell it so that um, everybody can understand. When I, so I was a director and I, so I'd moved over from consulting and I'd worked my way up to be a director at a startup company that had just gone through an IPO. And I was, got into a, a peer group and what it was is it was, I was, so I was in IT, so I was on the chief information officer track. So I reported directly as chief information officer and I went to the, you know, uh, CIO development program is what it was called. And it had a, a lecture from Cal who was there. I mean, it was, it was a really nice uh, group and we're still friends to this day. They brought in the chief information officer from AMD, a very large hardware organization, multinational location. And when he started off his conversation, he said, I am going to give you my leadership secret tonight. And what it is, is it's the 80-20 rule. I go, okay, I can relate to that. Prado, I got you, man. 80% of the time is spent leading myself. 20% is leading others. And I tell everybody, cause I, you know, like you, like you gotta be honest at that point, I'm like, this guy's crazy. I guess I need to unplug right now. Like what's I'm looking around at my buddies going like, is this guy crazy? He went on to go do his talk. And by the time he was finished, of course, or not of course, but for me, I was like, this guy's a genius. Like, oh my goodness. Like, what am I missing out on? Like I, you know, and, and I think I had some level of self-awareness and I think I was aware enough at that point to get the message. That's where I needed to be. Like I had that foothold in self-awareness to realize, wait a second, my management strategy is askew because I was in the 20% managing myself, 80% managing others, and I had to reverse it. Is this common? Is this what you see out there? Is. And it's funny, I had uh, breakfast this morning with a friend that we um, met in the strategy consulting firm and, you know, he's off uh, doing very big things in tech right now. Um, but we got together and we're just laughing over uh, over some of these things, too, and that, uh, you know, when you are not leading, this is one reason why I don't usually teach this to undergrads uh, mm. or people that are very early in their career, because a lot of times I think they're too uh, they're too new to it. It's because if what you and I are talking about, uh, I'm sure there are some people going, well, duh, of right. course. Yes. Right. Uh, <laughs> but as we know, it's harder to do than it sounds. Yes. Uh, and so, uh, a lot of times I, I really like working with people, middle to senior managers, mm. um, who have, as I say, been around the block, and probably hit a wall or two, uh, yeah. <laughs> because that's when they realize, oh, this isn't fluff, right? This is actually important, and and it's hard to do. So you know, as, as I, I think I mentioned, I get a lot of STEM people uh, in right. a lot of tech people in uh, uh, in my programs because that's exactly where they are. This this leadership thing, which I thought was a bunch of bunk or fluff or you know, so obviously easy, but now I realize it's not. Uh, and it's it's not just about best practices, really. It's about, you know, it, who are you and how do you show up to other people? And so uh, break down for us a little bit of, of, you know, some of the core concepts that you think really could help anchor people. I want to make sure that, you know, we're, we're, we're breaking it down and giving them some bite-sized chunks so that they can understand this too. Yeah, yeah. So the way I look at it is that, uh, you know, you are in a current state. I'm in a current state. Everybody is. Uh, and so the um, the idea is, is that you have to understand yourself. And this is where you look at. And, you know, mm -hmm. I, I, I do a lot of kind of um, multi-layered questions with people to help them get at this. You know, the first one, as I, I mentioned, is, you know, who who are you? Who and what thinking has, has impacted you right. for better and for worse? And sometimes it's both. Uh, that mm. sometimes we have old ideas of who we are or what we should do kind of thing. And we have to kind of go through and say, does that, is that really true? Is that really true? Was yeah. it ever? And, and certainly is it now? Does it, does it serve me now? Um, so, you know, who and what has shaped you? What events? Uh, what are your values? What's your, your definition of success? Uh, and I find that a lot of times if we don't know what it is, we're just being carried along with, whatever social media uh, mm. thinks is 
of success, which oftentimes is more, right? Right. more, uh, you know, more money, higher title. And, and yet, mm. you know, sometimes that's not really what it is. Uh, but if people don't know that, then they're kind of pulled along uh, with that. Um, you know, and, and also, uh, you know, do people understand what emotions they're having and how yes. they, uh, you know, I, I ask people, do you, you know, uh, how do you show up when you're angry? Uh, how do you show up when you're sad? Or, you know, or these different things. And most people don't know. Wow. Um, and I say, yeah, but everybody else does. <laughs> everybody sure. else knows. Yeah. Uh, so these are things. And then also, you know, what kind of feedback have you received? Uh, and especially the one you didn't agree with you want to fight about because that's oftentimes the one that hits closest to home. <laughs> that's the it's, one that's getting you there you want to pay attention to yeah exactly so that's kind of the whereas i say you sort of go inward you also kind of go backwards in a way yes. uh, and that gives you insight insight into who am i what do i want what how mm. do i want to contribute to the to the world what are my skills and how do i want to um how do i want to bring those out into the world what change do i want to make in the world uh and then thinking about okay what do i need to do you know maybe i need some new skills you know or usually what it is is i need some new behaviors uh i need wow. to change the kinds of things. So, you know, if you think about uh, as you go through your career, very oftentimes when people are early in their career, they'll tell you, you need to speak up more in meetings. We need to hear your ideas, Christopher. Right, right. Uh, right. And then, you know, you get good at that. And then later they say, Christopher, you need to not talk as much in meetings, right? You know, <laughs> you need to let other people, right? But right. both were true at the time. Uh, and the mm -hmm. other is, you know, the if you've ever tried to learn to delegate, it's yes. hard. Right. Yes. Because I always say it's a it's a pendulum or, you know, it's Goldilocks. Right. Sometimes you um, you're micromanaging and then you go over here and you you don't uh, delegate, you abdicate. Right. And that right. has disastrous consequences as well. But you have to learn how to do it. So when you're learning a new skill, you oftentimes your performance goes down. Right. Mm. Because. But it, uh, but you have to kind of keep at it because that's the way we learn. Right. We learn in these these S curves that you get better slowly and then quickly, right? right. And so you have to keep at it. And uh, and then then you level off and it's time for a new one. It's time for, you know, a new skill or behavior. So uh, that's part of it. What, what do you, do you advocate for some type of a practice that helps people just reflect more? I, I realized that myself and you just, you, you struck a memory with me that it was really, going through this this journey of of managing myself that got me into uh, you know a morning journaling practice that got me into a seeking quiet time type practice because I realized that if I didn't have the time to do those things, I mean it's it's how am I feeling? How am I feeling right now? That was always sort of that. And then I would always sort of reflect on, you know, what, what had I done last week, last month, last quarter to try and say like, where, how am I growing? Is that something that you advocate for as part of a, a program like this? Yeah, I do. And I think it's, you know, uh, to me, it kind of goes at the heart of both self-management and resilience mm. in the uh, you know, the three things that we can do that help us with any kind of self-management are also the three things that help us with res resilience are oh. also the three things we all know and usually just don't do, right? It means you should get enough sleep, uh, which, right? You think of all the times in career that that was not the case and, and the, the ramifications of that. Uh, right. It's eating well, mm. uh, right? And, and I, I remember, I cannot remember his name, but he's a doctor from Columbia University. And he has a saying which really resonated with me. He said, you know, every brain cell begins at the end of your fork. Wow. That what you put, right? When you, what you put in your body becomes your, you know, becomes your body. Wow. And so what, right? And, and we feel better when we're eating well. Uh, That's right. Uh, right. You can tell the difference. Uh, and these are small things. And by the way, we all know them. Uh, and the third thing is exercise. It's just moving mm. your body because it helps with stress regulation. It also helps you sleep, right? All of these kinds of things. So 
you know, I, I teach this one program called uh, Emotional Intelligence and Leadership. And when I get to this part about, you know, self-management and I say, these are three things and everybody's all excited. And then I say those three things and I can just see everybody's face droop, you know, like, sort of oh. like, that, is that it? Like, isn't, isn't there like some magic thing? And it's like, no, it's actually fairly simple. Yeah. It, you just have to do it now. Just the doing <laughs> yes, it. Like yes. You knew it already. You just got to do it now. Yes. That's right. Yes. There's a big knowing doing gap in that area for most of us. Mm. And so is there a different way? Like I think of, we obviously lead ourselves, we're leading teams. And then as you ascend in leadership and you're influencing organizations, does, does some of how we manage ourselves change even more as, as, potentially where, you know, our scope or breadth of leadership changes? Absolutely. Uh, because I, I think when, you know, if you think about most people's career, yeah, uh, you kind of go through, you start off as an individual contributor, and then you're a part of a team, and then maybe you're managing that team, and then you're leading multiple teams, and then units, and maybe organizations. Um, but at each one of those levels, you have to, you have different relationships with people. Uh, and so that means that you, um, and it's not, it's not that, um, there's oftentimes people will say, well, learning this new behavior, whether it's delegating or speaking up more or speaking up less or, you know, whatever it is that they say, oh, it feels very inauthentic. Uh, and, but growth feels inauthentic, you know, think of a hard class that you had in college or something like that. You your brain hurt. Uh, and, and it can be the same thing with learning a new skill, that the, the discomfort is oftentimes a sign that you're growing, that you're stretching. You know, just like when you go and run and you haven't run for a while, those sore muscles are saying, yeah, I'm still here, <laughs> right? You, have, you haven't worked me for a while. Yeah, so I do think that you have to kind of constantly, I'm gonna say each new, each new level of your career requires kind of a new and improved you it's you it's you but ratchet it up right ratchet it up and and yeah the new skills to learn and new ways that you need to i mean i just found for myself that the more my career ascended the more i needed to focus on on managing all almost more subtleties right because everything was important i had larger impact on teams larger impact on myself. So you're right. Like I had to lock down some of the eating, some of the exercise. I had to show up much more prepared because I was making bigger decisions in moments. Yeah. And, and I, I think that, you know, and you also mentioned something I, uh, earlier that I think is really important and I, do, I don't want to skip it is yes. the self-reflection is that, you know, um, I, I don't think we're a terribly reflective society. Right. Uh, and a a lot of times people think that it's selfish. These mm. kinds of things are selfish and they are not. They're actually kind because when you're well rested mm. and you've eaten well and you've exercised, you show up better and you're better for everybody around you. Right. right? So that it's, it's uh, taking care of yourself helps to take care of other people. But the, uh, the other thing on the self-reflection is that uh, the, the higher up you go in your career, the more, whether it's people or money or, you know, projects that you're responsible for, actually the more important reflection becomes, uh, because, uh, as you say, you, you have to respond quickly in the moment and you don't right. want to be relying on, you know, kind of patterns in the past. You have to be very aware that things are different. You do. And, and this is one of the things that I learned working at startup companies is that it was, it was because I really focused on hyper growth companies that were, you know, getting ready to go through an IPO and then going through an IPO. And, and, you know, the, the one that really shaped me was a company called Splunk that I started in 2011, uh, probably around 300 people around $120 million in revenue. And then when I left, it was close to 3,000 people, a billion dollars in revenue five years later. So it was massive growth. And the one key thing that I learned is that the, the, the skills, the attitudes, the activities that we had last year will keep us in last year. Like we have to now, every year we have to reevaluate and say, you know, what do we, what do we want to keep? What do we want to throw out? And what do we actually need to learn to scale? Because the things that got us here, are going to keep us here. 
Yes, I, I think it's very, very well said. Uh, that, right, you as a company, we realize that you have to look out into the future, and even though it's very uncertain and things like that, you can't just go, "Well, we'll wait and see." <laughs> uh, right. And the same is true of us. Uh, that if we're not continuing to develop, we're actually backsliding, uh, and it, it hurts us and it hurts people around us. You know, I, I believe we're not the same as we were when we were ten years old, or eighteen years old, right. or twenty old right we change uh as and that's a good thing that's that's a good thing. it is a good thing and i i do think that 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 to me is an anchor and part of that self-awareness is being aware of who we are today versus who we were you know two years ago five years ago everything everything changes you know, so dramatically Absolutely. so quickly sometimes yeah yeah and and i think if we're intentional also about how we want to change that's better because we are changing the question is and i think that's one of the reasons why uh, a lot of times people do come to managing yourself and leading others is because i've definitely had people say you know i really wasn't paying attention to this and now i'm a person i don't want to be uh wow. and yeah and mm. so that, but you know i would say hey that's it's good to know where you're starting from right yeah a hundred percent. Like you, you got to have a starting line and that's the thing is the best time to plant a tree is what, 20 years ago and today, right? Yes. Yes. The second best time is today. That's yes. right. Uh, and so what, what do you see are some of the blockers for people? You know, I mean, so, so, you know, we have people that are in leadership that are listening to this right now and we want to help them understand like, you know, is there something that they could be unintentionally blocking themselves or the blinders are on or, you know, how do you get, how do you start getting even signals that, you know what, you may need to manage yourself a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's lots of different signs of people that are kind of low on, I'll say emotional intelligence or self-understanding, mm. et cetera. Uh, you know, there are things like they, people hold grudges. Uh, they're mm. easily out. They're easily angered. They oftentimes feel misunderstood, which is uh, right because they have something that they're thinking, but they're not portraying it the, that, the same way. Right. They have problems with relationships. They don't have long-term friendships or long-term relationships. Uh, you know, those are those are some of um, uh, the ones that that I see happen a lot. Mm. Um, but I, I think it's also that um, when people ascend in their career that we become so busy, right? Your day yeah. becomes chunked mm. up so in such a granular way that you can be buffeted by all kinds of different things. And so the, the when, and that I think causes a lot of that stress because yeah. people, yeah, are, A, aren't taking care of themselves, uh, don't necessarily understand themselves. And I, I think one of the, the biggest blockers that I see is actually, uh, what I'll call, you know, I shoulds or I need to, uh, or my boss won't allow that. And, you know, I teach another class in creativity and innovation and, and right. uh, I say there's multiple, multiple ways to solve a problem and we can't get stuck in that. We can't. And, and, and I mean, one of the things that you made me think about is, you know, is, is, <laughs> I started feeling at some point because I was really getting into a very busy part of my career and we had three children very fast. And I wasn't clear on how this worked growing up, but now I am clear is that we had a son and then 18 months later we had twins. Boom, three kids under, three sons under two. It was crazy. And so I was trying to, I knew that to be with my family, I had to set better boundaries. And what, in, in the one rule that always sort of has ruled my life, and I don't, I think I may have got this from my mom. I'm not sure where I get this, but it's everything's negotiable. I go in there and just negotiate. Like, let's figure it out. Let's try and drive to the win-win. But I always knew like what my, what my goal was in the conversation and also what my limit was. And I think that sometimes people do get stuck in some ways of thinking. I, you know, and this is now, a bit of a self-observation and then also observing some in others as people can get stuck from leading themselves because they they see these external forces and say, oh, to your point, that's a should, I must. And it's like, well, it's negotiable. Like, where do you where do you want to move that? And it's not, maybe it doesn't need to move 100% of the way overnight. Maybe you just want to move the goalpost 25%, know that you can move it and then keep moving it in that direction. Absolutely. And I always, you know, a lot of times I'll ask people, well, why do you say that? Right. You know, how do you mm -hmm. know? 
a very common one is, you know, uh, in, in my family, my husband and I, we take real vacations, right? We go, right. we like leave work behind. And um, people say, oh, my boss wouldn't allow that. I'm like, leave your phone at home, right? You know, oops. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, what's going to happen if the burn, if the building is burning, you know, you're not going to be able to do anything for them over the phone. They'll get out. Right. Uh, so, I mean, I think a lot of times we, uh, we think we're more important to our team, right? <laughs> we need to, we need to go away. We need to refresh. That's they right. need to refresh without us. So, um, so I oftentimes think, you know, people, uh, you know, checking email multiple times over a weekend and, mm. uh, I mean, there are times when you do need to, you know, if you're the business owner or, you know, you have a business where that is. But I, I think that we most businesses actually aren't like that. Um, and we it, to your point, it's kind of boundaries. Uh, yes. You know, what's going to work for you uh, as well? People will respect the boundaries that you put up. That to me is the most, you know, is, is I know in tech, it can easily bleed into a 24 by 7 lifestyle. And when I started setting boundaries and saying, OK, from. Um, you know, I think I get home like around six, but I'd say from six to eight, you know, until my kids get to bed, I'm offline. I can't do anything. The more I said that, the more everybody understood it and it became protected and it was fine. And then it became the new normal. Nobody then, you know, there, there's obviously the, the ramp up time. There's the establishing it. There's also making sure, again, I'm managing myself and I'm setting expectations. I'm getting what I need to done before I enter that time. Uh, but I, I think that there's, there is a, a, it starts with you. I think that's ultimately what I'm trying to communicate right here, right now is it does start with you and you can move it and it's negotiable. Absolutely. And I, I think what you said also is that when you set those boundaries, mentally, you're much better because now when you're with your kids, you're not thinking, oh, somebody's trying to reach me, right? You just know right. I'm here. Uh, and then when you're not with your kids, you're there. And it makes you better in mm. both realms. Uh, and, and also the other thing I think too, especially this is true of leaders, is that then you're giving permission for other people to take care of other things in their lives too. That's and right. they will be better. Uh, that actually sometimes working a little less, uh, sleeping a little more, or you know, being with your family or whatever it is, makes you much more productive while you are working. It really does. So w overall, what, are you, what have you seen as the benefits to teams that adopt this? So I would say that uh, it, it starts with any individual. You know, a lot of times people will um, say, well, it doesn't matter if I'm self-aware, if, you know, my boss <laughs> is hard. And right. I say, oh, it still does, right? Because really the only thing that you can control is you. Uh, and so, but the more control you have over that, the more um, you can manage other things. So, but with teams, I think that uh, it allows teams to have more, honest conversations mm. talk about what's really important or what's really going on as opposed mm. to hiding uh, mistakes or you know people being stressed out and not talking about it you know that just leads to a lot of burnout uh which you know pretty rampant right now no it is it is in in what i was thinking is what i experienced myself is as i became more emotionally aware and i was talking about things that I needed and, and providing permission for people to let me know what they needed, it created psychological safety. And then people start feeling like they can speak truth to power. They can Absolutely. say, I'm, I'm, you know what I, you're doing this. I haven't been spending time with my kid. Okay. Let's make How do we make this happen for everybody? What do we have right. to do to make it work? Yeah. Yeah, and that's the thing is you, you were saying it's negotiable. And I always say there's multiple ways to figure this out, right? It doesn't have to that's be right. a certain way. We can figure it out. We can, uh, uh, we, it's, it's up to us, right? We get to decide. Uh, so true. yeah, I think it can help teams a lot. But the other thing is, is that you can't force it on anyone, right? You can right. only do, you can only manage yourself. You can only, uh, and, and that's not nothing. It's not in here's one of the other takeaways too, is when you start managing yourself, you may start choosing to put yourself in different situations. You Absolutely. may then start choosing a different boss. Well, my boss isn't self-aware and I see how he's managing himself and I really don't want to be like him. And maybe yeah. there's other opportunities 
elsewhere where I can work for somebody who's actually now self-aware, managing themselves, and I could get more growth or I could live better. I could, you know, this is where I think it's really important for people to realize that when you start managing yourself first, that the ripple effect is this eye-opening awareness that may move you into situations where, um, now I don't know if people are going to give you three winning lottery tickets, but you could be getting just better oh. mojo in your direction. <laughs> Yeah. Well, and I, I also think, too, uh, that what you were saying is that, you know, being self-aware, you may have a boss that is really, really difficult. And, you know, we've probably all had that, too. Uh, but I the, and sometimes you are not in a situation where you can move yet. Uh, yeah. But being self-aware helps you say, you know, kind of turn the conversation for yourself to what can I learn here? Right. Mm -hmm. So it just changes it from being really rattled and stressed by this person to, uh, you know, what can I learn here? Uh, and sometimes what you're learning is how I don't want to make people feel. Uh, in, it's true. In and, and I've even been in the situation where being self-aware in having a boss that wasn't as self-aware in starting to ask questions of you know, they'll, they'll be in a moment where somebody left and maybe they're venting and they're frustrated. And then it's like, well, how else did that make you feel? Or you start doing a little active listening exercise with them and being really aware and they can hear themselves say things. Uh, I found that, you know, and I actually had a, a, a mentor of mine once tell me that if, if you are executing a discipline, the reality is, is that discipline will push into other people and not saying that they will adopt it the same way that you are but it will ultimately affect them, right? Uh, yeah, I think that's absolutely right. Uh, because it, it, uh, it changes you and it changes the way you interact with other people. So it changes the impact that you have on them. So absolutely, if it's good for you, it generally is good for other people. Wow, well, that's really exciting. Is, are, there any, are there any exercises or something that you would recommend for people who wanna get started with this? Yeah, I mean, I think one of them is is re self reflection. Uh, you know, I, I use some fairly deep questions and things like that, and I'm always happy to. If people want to, you know, send me an email. I'm happy to uh, do that or, or uh, find me on LinkedIn. That's always a, a very good way to do it. Uh, in fact, I'm running something on LinkedIn. Probably it'll start in about two weeks. It's called the Self Awareness Challenge. Oh, uh, and when I'm is I'm going to do one of the big questions each week for six weeks. And I'm just going to ask people if they would fill out a survey to tell me how long did you spend on it? Uh, mm. And, you know, did you have some insights kind of, I'm not going to ask them, you know, what their answers were, because that's obviously very private. Um, but if people want to do that, uh, it's going to probably start in about two weeks and uh, they can find me on LinkedIn. Oh, great. Well, I, I'll definitely put um, your LinkedIn and some comments about that in the show notes. The other things that I would tell people is <laughs> I was literally talking to a friend this morning who uh, I can't remember what they, they had to write out something. And I said, sometimes one of the great things about technology, technology can change our lives, is a tool like Otter. You can get a deep question and this is something that that I do now as far as journaling exercise. I may incorporate the journaling in the walking because I'll take a question, I'll look at it, I'll go walk, meditate, and I'll have my headphones on. I'll be talking to myself. Obviously, you have to feel comfortable looking a little crazy walking yes. around. But I'll go and I'll talk, and then I can go on to Otter and sort of distill out what were the main points that I took, and I can shape that and edit it into – something that then I want to put into my journal that makes the process a lot easier. But I also think that that process of walking, talking things out loud, even with yourself is, or especially with yourself is really valuable. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Any way that you have of reflecting is good. Uh, you know, whether some people journal, some people talk to themselves, some people actually talk to a friend, you know, some yeah. people talk to a therapist, and all of this is good. Right. Yeah. Uh, it's it's kind of sometimes it's getting what's in your head or in your heart, verbalizing it or writing it down. Because, you know, I, I'm a Harry Potter fan. Uh, and, you know, in, in Harry Potter, when they their mind is so full. Right. And you can't you've had your mind so full of thoughts that you can't think of anything else. So they would take their wand and take their thoughts out of their head. And right. Put them in a 
stir them up, right? And look at them for insight. To me, that's what journaling is. <laughs> it's, it's your own personal pen sieve. Uh, and, and what you're doing is very, very similar to that. It's kind of getting it out, right? It's kind of yeah. verbalized. And uh, it really does help because sometimes you you hear yourself say something and that gives you an insight, right? Like, oh, really? Oh. It does. Right. Word, right. But you, 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 noodle right. you can you hear yourself say things like, oh, that's great. Or I'm like, why did I say that? But yeah. I, I try to give people some of these tips because I think now, now journaling, you know, cause if people do want a record for posterity state, I'm saying there's other options besides getting in front of your computer that can be distracting, writing things out that people don't write a lot. So they get tired real quick. There's a lot of other options to get this done. Yes, absolutely. Um, lots of different ways to do it. Uh, and what works for one person doesn't work as well for another. And that's totally that's right. fine. I think you just have to experiment with it. Mm. Uh, but what works for you and try something for a week. And if it eh, not not hitting the mark, then try something else, uh, something. But the point is, just do it. Just try it. It is. It is. Try try some self-reflection and, and just becoming a little bit more aware. Well, Margaret, thank you so much. I really appreciate the time. We're going to move now into the fire round where I'm going to hit you with five right. questions. And you're going to help um, help us understand how you would respond to how do you keep learning? How do I keep learning? I teach, uh, mm. which is the best way uh, because I have to keep current. Uh, so I'm constantly, every single time I teach something, I teach it a little bit differently. You know, I'm looking at, you know, academic studies, et cetera. I read a lot, uh, mm. uh, read online paper, all kinds of stuff. I read cereal boxes, right? All of those <laughs> kinds of <laughs> Yeah. Teaching exactly. and reading. You know what Xanthum gum is. Yes. You can read <laughs> yes. the cereal boxes. <laughs> Yeah. What do you do to recharge? Uh, the big one is I swim. Yeah, I swim, oh. uh, especially, you know, I, I swim on a master's team, but I, um, I also swim on my own and I love open water swimming. I swim at Walden Pond, which is uh, yeah. absolutely magical. Uh, so it's a half mile across, half mile back, do a few laps on that. And uh, I feel like a totally new person afterwards. Oh, that's amazing. What what is a sage piece of advice that you would give your younger self? Oh man, so many things. <laughs> I don't know if it's hard to pull out a couple. I guess number one would be chill. Uh, mm. You know, um, and then to just ask yourself, what do you want? What mm. do you want, uh, for these kinds of things? Because I, I think a lot of times when I was younger, uh, I kind of did what other people wanted. That's right. And, yeah, so I would just just say pause and ask, what do you want? That's great. I love that. What soft skill do you believe has helped your career the most? Observation, I would say. Observation. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm an introvert, so I um, am generally the quieter one in a meeting. Uh, so that gives me a lot of time to look and watch. And so I'm pretty good at picking up on cues, uh, you know, what people are saying and not saying uh, and right. things like that. So I would say observational skills. And it kind of goes along with listening. And what is the best investment of time that you've ever made? Oh, my gosh. I, I mean, it would be for me, as I say, I'm an introvert. It's spending time with other people, uh, people that really... Um, make me think differently, mm. uh, jazz me up with new thoughts. You know, I have some friends that I just, you know, I have some friends that I get off the phone with and I'm just, no matter what, I'm just in a better mood. And I have other friends where I get off the phone and I, my head is bursting with new ideas. So, uh, so yeah, this introvert gets a lot of energy from other people. So that, and you know, I say that with my kids, uh, I say that with my husband, you know, so it's not just friends and coworkers. It's, uh, you can learn a lot from everybody. It's everybody. Well, thank you so much for the time. We really appreciate you being here. And I just want to let everyone know that we are a new podcast. So please subscribe and listen on Spotify, Apple, Google, Amazon, you name it, we're there. And I would also say if, give us a review. We would love to understand what you're taking away from this podcast and please
please just share it with somebody. Our goal is to help people figure out this whole career and money thing and how it all works. So please let people know that we're here for them. Thank you very much.